Let's get that guy sat down. What are they? I thought I thought they were shuttles. I don't know. It's a ship I've never seen before. They have one, two, three, four engines in there. Maybe a five-year mission out to the frontier is for somebody else. Crazy sounds. Like, it sounds like humans screaming, and you're just like, no. Nope. It's, it's 19 zeros times bigger than yeah. the sun. It should be collapsing into a black hole. Right. Into many black holes, which then collapse into one black hole. Today, we're doing Star Trek Beyond. What did you think about this episode? Episode? That's... That's a good point. Star Trek Beyond is a movie, but it feels like an episode, in my opinion. Gotcha. The storyline isn't as epic as a movie requires, in my opinion. So, therefore, six out of ten. I. Th oh, yeah, just six savage, out of ten. Just savage explanation. I mean, six out of ten is not. It's not great, not terrible, but right, right there in the middle. D's um, get degrees. That is right. It's a sixty percent. That is scraping by with a D. So I did think I did like the production values of Star Trek Beyond. So like great sets, uh, there's good acting, good CG. I did like when they were like going through the USS Franklin. I kind of enjoyed that uh, ex exploration part being down on the planet. Um, and there were some cool ideas in there. Like the space station was kind of cool with the gravity all over the place. Um, but there were a lot of problems. Like the swarm tech was overpowered. I didn't know why Starfleet didn't have a contingency for that. The Yorktown, which was cool tech. What, what are we doing putting this in vulnerable space? What are we doing? Um, the Franklin being operational felt weird. Like it's, what, a couple hundred years old? What, okay. Um, and it, like we said, it felt like an episode instead of a movie. Because, I don't know, it didn't have these huge overarching storylines, character development, in my opinion. Uh, it felt like it could have been like an episode of The Next Generation. Um, and I didn't feel the character arcs like in previous movies, especially Star Trek one from 2009. I really feel like the characters and, and their development and the feeling of hopefulness for Starfleet and Kirk and Spock. I just don't, I didn't feel that in this one so much, but overall it's a solid entry, lots of problems, but a solid entry. So overall I give it a six out of 10. What did you think? I also gave it a six out of 10 for similar reasons actually so there's a different there's definitely a different feel from the first two films it was a lot more philosophical in there in this movie and it dealt with the internal feelings of of the characters which i i'm super into i, I dig that stuff um i agree that there wasn't so much of a character arc for the characters for, for most of the characters maybe one or two um but there was very good character arcs for the characters across the series. And so I see what you're saying in terms of an episodic feeling where you may have one episode that, that focuses on character A, then the second episode is on B and C and it separates it. But across the whole, across the entire series, I felt like there was very good character arcs for, for a lot of the characters. The sci-fi was super cool. So there was like the, the main enemies, or I guess the only enemies, have this distributed swarm attacks. Very cool, very sci-fi. I mean, I guess we do encounter that now, like the Navy will get attacked by a fleet of little little skiffs. Um, but that's really not the same as this like dangerous this swarm where they're attacking you from all sorts of angles. Uh, very cool. And the enemies could live forever by stealing life from people, effectively vampire, but technological. Um, yeah, cool, cool ideas. And and I really like these in this idea movies when when you have characters or people that are stranded on islands or planets and then you see how their culture evolves over time. So the consequences of being stranded. And we see that in Star Trek Beyond with, with the bad guys. Super cool. I like these things. Um, the cons about this movie is that the science is, m is much worse. It's much worse compared to the previous two Star Treks. It very much feels like an afterthought. Now, that's okay because in principle it's an it's like a sci-fi action film it's not it's not a scientific journal right but but the problem is that you get scenarios that if you were to pay attention to the science you did the things carefully they just wouldn't happen and if if that's okay if it's a little side plot or whatever side you know side joke or whatever but if it's actually a plot point that should never have happened it feels it, it rips me out of the universe it rips me out and it's like this is now drama for the sake of drama which which i feel like we should have purposeful drama that naturally arises from the scenario and then the characters have to deal with it. I think this is the most compelling, the co most compelling storytelling we can do. Okay, and then the enemy, the, the crawl, the bad guy, was his 
It was his underlings. Were they were they all the 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 bad guys that are like swarming the ship? Were they his former crewmates? Because by the end, he doesn't care about them. They're like dying left and right, and he's just like mission oriented. I'm focused. I want to I want to take it to Starfleet. And like, but if you're the captain and your crew is dying, you feel like you should care more about that. Weird weird, weird inconsistency about. Them. Um, and then Starbase Yorktown is severely underdefended, which it's like a glass ball sitting out there in space and can be attacked from all sorts of angles. And I feel like in the Kelvin timeline, which has had Nero and Khan, and, and they should be, they've even said that that because of Nero and Khan, the, the Starfleet is aggressively searching space. I feel like under the Kelvin timeline, Starfleet should be more cautious. And so the Starbase should be more, there should be onions and, and like onion layers of defense around Starbase Yorktown. And so to have this, this Yorktown Starbase so exposed feels inconsistent to the universe, which felt weird. It felt weird because the Kelvin timeline is supposed to be this more battle-worn timeline, but then here we are doing very, being super exposed. Very strange. Okay, that was it. Ready to talk about the, episode, the movie? 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 Let's do it. So this is on the bridge of the Enterprise towards the beginning of the movie. I want to look at these bridge screens here. So like this okay. tactical screen here on the left. What left. is, yeah, what are the, okay. So we've got a big circle, which, and then we've got three little circles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've got like overlapping things on top of the, like how can this, is this a tactical screen? <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. Actually, I don't know who the tactical officer is on this Enterprise. Well, that's a good point. But I think it's the reasonable place, right? Yeah. And you know, I, know what this I, is. I actually don't know if it's a tactical screen. I've just seen in like other movies, they have those transparent things where they like write on this with the special markers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking that's that's like battle tactics, but maybe, maybe not. Because yeah, now no that idea. I'm looking at it, it looks like it's a circuit diagram. He's doing like diagnostics maybe nope. <laughs> me <laughs> yeah i don't know mm, mm. circle okay this is ridiculous but is this like a water tank <laughs> three water tanks because because my first thought would be engines because that's super important for the ship but yep. there shouldn't be three you'd have two nacelles and then the warp core but then why would they be rep represented all three of the same objects i don't understand that Maybe it's a single nacelle, and there's three things within a single nacelle. It's... But then you need to have two sets of them because there's two nacelles. Maybe he's looking at one at a time. Yeah, it's too much speculation, I think, for that. I... Plus, he's you've got this standing screen, and when mm -hmm. the Enterprise gets hit, people get thrown around in the bridge. Mm -hmm. Let's get that guy sat down. That's right. <laughs> strap or, in. Or, or there's like an emergency evasive maneuvers, like strap him up against the walls, or strap him up against the screen. He's like pressed against it. Yeah. <laughs> also possible. Yeah, there's a little table here. Depending on the angle, you may really be able to see stuff. That's true. And then over here by Ahura, she's got. What's she looking at? Looks like waveforms. I think that makes sense. She's communications. She's deciphering right. stuff, looking at waveforms. I think that makes yeah, sense. And then to the right of her is like the situation where the Enterprise is. There's like a star or planet. Okay. Yeah, okay. Maybe. The Enterprise is here. You're getting some signals bounced around. Yeah. So that's like her cool. overview. That kind of makes sense. Right, nice little nice little lamp here. That's pretty That's pretty convenient. Pretty convenient. I don't know what Although, you would be able... There's several oh. lamps and some of them point at yeah. her face. That would be annoying mm -hmm. as heck. And then the, the that reading lamp snake thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like it's kind of made for like if you're writing on the top desktop, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there's no place to put papers or anything. It's just oh, control gosh. panels. I mean, I guess if these are not pressure sensitive, you could lay it down on top. That's true. Do I want to be laying things down on my controls, even if they're not pressure sensitive? I don't know. And also, I guess if she's laying down like a piece of paper to write on, it's like the only piece of paper on the starship. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> that's, that's right. got to be some contraband stuff, right? Because they, they use like data pads. That's right. And then if you're using data pads, you should just backlight it. Backlight it like a Kindle. Like a Kindle. Cause what is this thing? This reminds me know. of like at, a, at an arcade. You know, the, the light goes around. You have to press the timing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is the little relax station for people on the bridge. Yeah, a little, play a little, little game. A little chill time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 
I mean, to me, that looks like the science station. And so that's a science thing. And the only thing I can come up with is, have you ever used like an old gauge or something? And in, on the old gauge, it's like got a mil, like four or five gauges with mm -hmm. the, each little unit system. So yep. you can see multiple gauges at the same time. So that's what I'm seeing there. It's like so. There's like there's a, there's like an analog needle that like will yeah. rotate around depending on yeah. I don't know whatever you're measuring, and yeah. it's like these are different different scales. Yeah, but yeah, okay. but maybe it's some kind of digital version of that where I can customize it. Yeah, maybe very very specialized screen, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't have another explanation. I mean, it's got to anyway. be important because they they've actually changed the shape of the of the. I don't know shelf or the desk. That's true. That's true. It's designed for this thing. It's designed and it's large. They they broke counter continuity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it needed to be large, so it's very important. It must be. Hmm. Gosh, and look at those things here. What are these? Oh yeah, yeah. Another another over. It's got to be overview. So if if guy that guy walking onto the bridge right now glances over, and he looks hmm. at the screen, he can get some kind of quick overview of the situation and it's not for uhura because that's that's too high up i guess she could yeah. see it if she leans back but this is this is not it's not like angled down towards her yeah so this is for everyone yeah I buy so maybe explanation. maybe you walk onto the bridge and you take a glance at everybody's like screens situation high up, screens and then you can yep. be like okay i know what's going on and then you can go mm -hmm. to your station and slot right in okay actually that's super smart mm -hmm. right because this guy who's walking on the bridge he can look around at everyone's up up panels top panels yeah. top and panels. then figure out what everyone's doing and like okay yep. okay i know what the okay, situation okay. is go back to my thing mm -hmm. i like it that's clever plus it looks cool so it looks dope looks cool okay the thing i don't like about this though is imagine being Ohura and working like this is your work environment. This is your your cubicle. This is where you're signed, and you just constantly have someone watching over your back. <laughs> like, oh, right? This because yeah, this guy's because this is a see through see through screen. It's like plexiglass or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's constantly watching. Like, you're Ohura, like let like, me wants a text or text message. Like, yeah. you can't. You can't. <laughs> the guy behind me is like, hey, get back to work. He's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to waste time. I want to watch a video. It's downtime. He's like, ah, I can't. I can't because they'll see me. I can't do it. Oh, I'm no professional. Breaks. Not a single break. So I guess this is the break thing. You come over here, play that light game. Like press the button. <laughs> You're like, why are you misusing equipment? Ah, so uh, obvious. Uh, let me show you. Let me show you. Maybe you can get it. Maybe you can get it <laughs> at the light of the right time. Like in the, oh, that's good. And then this guy's like absorbed in the game. <laughs> <laughs> you just rope him into your addiction. And then bridge operational readiness, you know, plummets. Plummets. Uh -huh. Shouldn't have been such a weirdo. Stop mm -hmm. watching what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. This was interesting. The Enterprise is going through space, and it's really warping space. Like we can see the warping. I wonder what this is about. Let's watch. Gosh. Yeah. So normally in Star Trek, we just mm -hmm. you just they just jump, just and then jump. you don't see this bubbly stuff. Yeah. Curious. So so I want to relate this to like, there's a TNG episode where these people were protesting warp drive and they're like, it's polluting space. And then the enterprise crew was like, no, it's not polluting space. There's no way. And then towards the end, they were like, oh crap. Actually, we're the protesters space. were correct. Uh, space is getting warped permanently and it's in a sense polluting space. So maybe this is consistent with that episode where the enterprise and warp drive like really messes up space and yeah maybe maybe uh yeah curious so so in in previous star treks you just see them jump but here you definitely have this this bubble for it looks kind of like a supersonic bubble kind of does yeah because hmm. i mean they are going faster than the speed of light in space hmm. so you're getting some kind of space shock wave thing yeah maybe this looked to me like this looked to me like a laser plasma interaction. So with the laser plasma interaction, you take a you take a, a volume of gas, you mm -hmm. you blast it with the laser, and okay. the laser it's high energy, so the gas atoms absorb some of the photons and they eject the electrons. You get a little little positive bubble surrounded by negative electrons, and okay. so you get a bubble. And so so this looks kind of like that, where where here the 
Enterprise is acting like that laser and it's causing this this cavitation, this bubble of gas atoms. Uh, oh. Maybe that's what it is. Is that maybe we're they're going through a nebula right now? Maybe. Or you think like they're going through a nebula and the gas bubbles near the Enterprise are like heating up a lot, creating this like bubble expansion? Maybe. I mean, it really does look like a laser plasma interaction where you even get these like cavitations, these like ripples. And not cavitation. You get these like multiple bubble structure. Right. Interesting. Mm, that, yeah. Happen. Interesting that there is a bubble structure and it's not sort of a continuous expansion. Right. Maybe that's it. Which, Maybe I, don't know. I was thinking it was space was getting messed up, but actually, oh, I, you're thinking I mean, it could be that. It could be that too. Like if there's like a say if there was a nebula and because mm -hmm. because this the the bubble. I guess how do I say this? This bubble is much larger than the Enterprise. Yep. So it's not like it's not like if you were to shoot a bullet through cheese. What is this example? Okay. <laughs> okay. No. If you were to shove a pencil through cheese, right? Okay. Then you get like a narrow hole there. But yep. for the most part, the cheese is okay. This is like actually, if you shot a bullet through cheese, like you get cavitation, you get just destruction, yeah. you get it ripped apart. Maybe yeah. Maybe that's really is damaging space. Yeah. And then I was interpreting. See how it's like. If you look into a bubble, it's dark, mm -hmm. but then on the outskirts of the bubble, mm -hmm. yeah, it's bright. I was thinking that as some kind of like gravitational lensing. Oh. So like the warping of space is like super warped there. And I see. That, that's so I thought it was dark here and then light on the edges because you're just compressing the gas. So you heat them up and then they mm -hmm. shine light. But I see what you're saying. Maybe this is actually light in the background and should be uniform, but then you're actually damaging the curvature of space-time in these dark spots. Mm -hmm. And then we actually, it never, we never see the end of like the wake. I don't know what to call it, the wake. The wake, yeah. Where the space like returns to normal. So that means the Enterprise is like messing up space. If it's what it is, if it's truly space mess up, then it's take, it takes a long distance for space to return back to flat space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, imagine if if a starship jumped past or warped, warped nearby a mm -hmm. planet. Like it's the planet would feel these ripples. That's right. You get like wake turbulence. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. And if we're talking about changing the fabric of space time in this wake turbulence then you're like even your clocks would get all weird like oh. sense of time would get all messed up oh my gosh yeah it would be like vibration in space and time all your satellites would get desynchronized oh boy oh boy oof yeah <laughs> oh boy, okay. oh all boy. Right. All right. and then gosh this is the yorktown it's just so exposed and mm -hmm. mccoy is able to cut through his like I don't know, enthusiasm for the technology and be like, this is a snow globe in space. Wow, that is impressive. She's a beauty, isn't she? What a damn monstrosity. Couldn't we just rent some <laughs> space on a planet? Showing geographical favoritism among inducted Federation <laughs> worlds could cause diplomatic tension. Looks like a damn snow globe in space just waiting to break. He's so good at like cutting through the, the I don't know what you call it, the, the details. Yeah, and just cutting through it and getting to the point. He's done this several mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. He's just he's right. It looks in it looks difficult to defend and it's ready to break. Mm -hmm. What are they So doing? you get all these science nerds that are like, Oh my yeah. gosh, look at the engineering, oh my gosh, the possibilities. But then you get a realist saying like, mm, but there are problems. Mm -hmm. Right there, there's a problem. Yeah. Right there, there's a problem. Yeah, and, and the the space the starship needs both of these personalities. But yeah, that's right. The way he cuts through it and then like right down to like simple terms and like clearly here's the problem that I've exposed. Right. Super good. Right. Like Cuz it's a snow a snow globe has something inside of it that you want to keep mm -hmm. inside. It's also fragile. Yep. If you drop it, yep. it breaks. Yep. So he's getting the circul like the sphericalness of it. He's yep. getting it's the containerness of it and the fragility oh. of it. Like mm -hmm. he's really he chose the right object to describe it. Spot on analogy. Man, if they had just had him on the Yorktown design and security team, it wouldn't have been a problem. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a snow globe in space anymore. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I mean, gosh, if they put it near Earth in Sector 001, like it's super defense, defensible. The Starfleet is out on the outskirts of the Federation defending it. 
and it's exposed like a planet i'm sure yeah but it seems like in this movie it's like it's on the frontier it it's the population's too large for a frontier snow globe well, it'll be relevant in the we'll talk about this a little bit more as t- as we go through here Oh yeah, one thing I wanted to point out here was look at the tessellation. Is that the right word? Tessellation is when you take a pattern and then you slide it and then you slide it and you slide it. Yeah, so the, the tessellation on the glass or whatever it is on the outside oh, this, of this, the You're talking about this stuff? Yeah. Okay. So so what is it? It's There's two types of hexagons being repeated so you again like a and regular, again. A regular hexagon. Yep. And then these two side two length hexagons how do i say this long side short side hexagons yep and then they're in some sort of pattern where it looks like there's this i don't know how you would make a unit cell for that but i wonder why they chose that particular pattern was it is that a yeah good question so yeah so first thing was i thought this was like a soccer ball it was a soccer ball soccer ball is hexagons and pentagons Mm -hmm. and you think it wouldn't work out but it does i mean soccer soccer balls exist Mm -hmm. and so if you get a hexagon hexagon they're all the same hexagons then you then you wouldn't get a curvature you get a flat plane and then then you get honey you get honeybees right or Mm -hmm. honey bee comb or Uh, all bees all bees do this you get you get comb but i guess because when you get hexagons and pentagons then then it somehow is the right shape to form a sphere Mm mm-hmm and so I guess that's that's I think that's what they did here. I mean, you start off with hexagons yep. in like a tessellated two D array, and then you start shrinking some of them, and then it curves into a sphere. That makes sense to me. It's just yeah. I mean, I, I guess that has to be the motivation. You they couldn't make a giant glass ball with no, I don't know what you would call it, joints, mm. and they couldn't make a force field thing i guess and so well, because if you join... ever have power down then everyone dies <laughs> like, oh, gosh. Like, you, you do yeah. want some physical structure yeah so they need joints and they need mm-hmm. glass of some type whatever it is transparent aluminum mm-hmm. and then so this is the pattern they have chose they probably had lots uh, of patterns to choose from but this and is then the one from they chose. an engineering perspective it's much easier to make the 120 degree angles than it is to make a hexagon that meets with a pentagon so whatever whatever oh. that thing is I like yeah. that. Yeah. The angles were easier to manufacture. Mm-hmm. Easier also means more consistent, which means consi- yeah. higher, higher security, higher strength. Yeah. Yep. Although Gosh. I wonder, I wonder, Go is ahead. it, because what is it the right shape? Because I could also imagine this being close to the right shape and then you end up with like a flat spot on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, uh, then you might have like, I don't know what you would call it, like a shim shape. Like a, to just fill in the mm, the missing yep, piece yep. if it doesn't perfectly tessellate so on the sphere. So ugly, so ghetto. Yeah, you're just like, oh, we'll put some play doh right there, <laughs> <and> cover it <laughs> up, like, right? <laughs> but maybe this docking thing, they can put all the extra space into this docking section, oh. and so any misalignment is lost into this. Um, I don't know, opening for the spaceships yeah, to come in and out. Any minutes alignment, you just cover it up and you turn you turn the problem into a feature. Yep, and yep. it's like, oh, this is where we put a do- the space dock. You just space dock should come in yeah. and cover it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some mathematician comes along and is like, that's not going to tessellate right. And you're like, that's right. That's why right. Tessellate? But do that's you see how it exists? It's clearly working. <laughs> mathematician, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Take a seat. <laughs> Dang. Uh, oh. <laughs> I'm just asking a question. Sit down. Sit down. It's already why functioning. Do- yeah. 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 yeah why, okay. <laughs> Dang, that engineer yeah. was mean. A mean <laughs> engineer. Yeah. What super cool, cool structure. Cool structure. Probably very interesting tech. It's a snow globe in space, though. Yeah. Yeah. The unit cell question was interesting. I don't know how to solve that. Yeah. I think there's a lot of math theorems about unit cells and tessellation and different shapes, but I don't know them off the top of my head for sure. I'm familiar with the standards unit cells for crystallography for 3d condensed matter but i've never i've never thought about that one yeah the defense procedures for the snow globe in space which is the yorktown they're just inadequate because if we look at this picture right here 
this the Yorktown is right there on the lower left. One of the sensors for incoming unknown objects is in the upper right. Mm -hmm. And an unknown object is in between them. This is damn close. I would want my 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 defensive sensors and long-range sensors like many light years away from the Yorktown. So right. I would have time to react when things are coming in at warp speed. The sensors they have here are just like right there. If some if a ship was coming in at warp speed, you'd never have time to react. They're on top of no you. No chance. And Yorktown's toast. I mean, heck, even if they're coming in on this impulse power or even thruster power, this thing is just drifting. So they got plenty. They, this thing is just drifting, and it still got past the the sensor tower. Yeah, literally got past the sensor tower. So what the heck? Like, it should nothing should be able to get that close. That's not authorized. That's right, man. I mean, heck. Not only should there be one radius for the sensor towers, there really should be like an onion layer, like layers and layers and layers. And so yeah. there's there's sensor towers way on the outside, but then you but as something gets closer, it has to encounter one layer of defense, second yep. layer of defense, third layer of defense, right. uh, because this these this is super exposed. It's super yep. the the Yorktown super exposed. Like if heck, even if a bit of space debris comes zipping in. And so right. they're not going to detect it with like electronics. They're not going to mm -hmm. detect like radio waves coming out of the ship. Like a little nope. space debris can come in and damage this this um, atmosphere holding shell. Yeah. Gosh, so you really have yeah. to have you really have to have lots of early warning. Especially especially because out of these these defense towers and out of the Yorktown, they scramble out runabouts, little like little shuttles for defense. It's not like they're scrambling out entire starships. The, yeah. the defense is super weak. Yeah, for something this high in population, you're gonna need you're gonna need a fleet defense fleet of ships of different types for rescue, for defense, mm -hmm. for all kinds of things. And they just have runabouts. What? Right. Say the runabouts. Say say you want to stop this ship, and so you like get out there, get out there, and and use tractor beams, but like the runabouts don't have a lot of mass. Like <laughs> the runabouts could get pulled a thing. You don't have to have big ships ready to defend. And and as you were saying earlier, if this was nearby Earth, okay, okay, because you yeah. have Earth's fleet hanging out. But if this is out on the frontier, then this is super vulnerable. Super vulnerable. In fact, I think we have video here of how the defense procedures go down when this thing drifts in, and it's all kinds of bad. So close. Oh my gosh. IFF alert on incoming vessel. Unidentified, non federation. Attention, unidentified vessel. You are not authorized for approach. Power down and await instruction. Unidentified vessel, please comply. I mean, if you're that unauthorized and that close, I mean, I don't think you should, you should be shot down, right? Vaporized. Absolutely. You're too close. And, and that this like uh, unauthorized vehicle, please do this, please do that. That should be much farther out so that mm -hmm. the crew of the ship that is supposed to be there has time to react and be like, oh, shoot, my bad. But also gives the, the defensive ships time to prepare mm -hmm. um, so that when they make the decision to destroy the ship, it's like we went through layer one, we went through layer two, we went through layer three. This is an aggressive ship. We're making the call. We're destroying yep. it. We gave him plenty of warning. Yep. There's no questions about, like, did we give him a chance? Like, we gave him plenty of chances. Yeah. So and, their defensive... And these runabouts should just grab the ship. Just just grab it. Just circle around it, tractor beam, lock it in place. But gosh, would you want to... If it, Okay. It, it, the communication and the defense is all happening simultaneously. So... They're communicating with the ship while simultaneously going to destroy it. It's just so, it's happening so fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everything. That means. Oh. These aren't what? runabouts. What are they? I thought I thought they were shuttles. I don't know. It's a ship I've never seen before. They have one, two, three, four engines in there. Oh. Interesting. So maybe these are defense ships. Oh, they're, they're, that's a large ship. Oh, yeah. That's like Enterprise size. That's I see a saucer section. I mean, maybe. maybe I, I don't know. Hard to tell. But then why is it it's close just... to the Yorktown? you got to get it out on patrol. Yeah, get it out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and why is it launching from the Yorktown? It should launch from these these um, defense points out here. 
That's right. I guess I guess you know, some come from New York Town, some come from these defense points. They meet in the middle, yeah. and capture the thing. You, you, you probably okay. Yeah, you'd have to have some kind of plan for how this defense goes down, and I don't think that plan involves every ship is in the Yorktown or near it. That's right. You're gonna have some out outside the Yorktown deployed in some kind of smart defensive grid. Hmm. My only thought of why this may be like this is just that it becomes expensive. Because say if you have Yorktown and mm -hmm. you cover the eight directions, then yep. you have one ship below, above, below, left, right, east, right, uh, north, south, east, west, yep. up Zenith and yep. Adir. And then as you get into a larger radius, you need more than eight because because the the, the range that they'd have to cover is larger and larger and larger. It grows like right. one of our uh, it grows like R squared. And so then if it's really on the frontier and Starfleet's really aggressively pushing out and then they don't have enough ships, then maybe that's why they don't have enough ships to defend this thing. Um, that being said, then this should be further closer back to home because it's just too, it's too risky. Because right, then you can get, if you, if you bring it close to like Vulcan or Earth or one of the, the planets of the Federation, you can double up the defenses. Mm. The defense oh, yeah, of the yeah. Earth and Dual defense purpose. of Yorktown is the same. Right. But if you floor deploy a bunch of snow globes, now you have, and you're resource constrained, you can't build enough ships, you're in trouble. What is Starfleet doing? What is Starfleet doing? Weird inconsistency, right? It feels yeah. like for the Kelvin timeline, this should be much more fortified. Yeah, agreed. And then, oh, it gets worse. The, the Yorktown, the snow globe in space that's super vulnerable, they build it next to a nebula. And not only did they build it, okay, First off, nebulas are actually maybe not a problem in real life because they're like really diffuse it's a, gas. It's a thin gas. You can yeah. see through them. Yeah, See through them. But here they're saying it's a, it's a dense nebula and they can't scan it. So they put the Yorktown right next to an uncharted section of space. What, 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 what are we doing? Just get it done. We tracked her stranded ship to a sector of uncharted nebula. Uh, long range scan? No data. The nebula is too dense. It's uncharted space. If you're going to build the Yorktown next to a, a nebula, chart the nebula. Like, get it done. Get your engineers together. Get your, you know, your Starfleet officers together and get it done. Don't just sit there and be like, well, that was, that's difficult. Get it done. That's this like, is, the, that's like, that's like you have, you have an empty field and then, and then a sharp cut off and there's a jungle. And then, and then you, <laughs> for every night you hear the crazy sounds. Like, it sounds like humans <laughs> screaming and you're just like. No, it's too dense. I can't check it yeah. out. Like, yeah. <laughs> either either don't yeah. build your your home there, or chart some missions. Go out there and figure it out. Go out and figure it out. Yeah, and create defenses. Especially okay, if you're not going to chart, at least create like a solid defensive line where the field meets the jungle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is in our case where the, you know, the regular the space town meets, meets the nebula. The nebula. Weird. Weird. Also, it seems strange that Star Trek, Starfleet, Starfleet is this exploratory science oriented organization. And yeah. then here's this nebula like right there. Right. Go check it out. Go check it what out. What are we doing? And it's like too right. dense, too dense. So go check it out. Right, right. So you Just get put your you, hands up. Yeah. So on one hand, you need it for defense because you want to defend the Yorktown. So chart it. But then they're also an exploration organization. Like this is unknown territory. Like, And it's interesting because we can't scan it. Mm -hmm. Go explore. It doesn't Weird. make sense. Weird. Weird. Feels mm. like a problem that just, it needs to be, it needs to be a problem there. Like right. Mm. Plot pointy. This was super cool. So with the commander, I'm not sure what her rank was. She is talking with Kirk about the characteristics that a captain needs to have. And she's expect, yep. she's anticipating that he's feeling lonely because it's hard to be a captain. Mm-hmm. It isn't uncommon, you know, to want to leave, even for a captain. There's no relative direction in the vastness of space. There's only yourself, your ship, your crew. It's easier than you think to get lost. Super cool. I really like this. I really like this because Kirk is almost always portrayed as just like gung-ho and, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll jump into the problem, we'll solve it later. I mean, literally is look before you leave. And so here on this run part way through this five-year mm -hmm. mission, he's encountering some loneliness, some 
maybe I'm maybe not mental health issues at that level, but he's having some mm-hmm. he's having a lot of time for introspection. And and that's right, because as the captain of the ship, who can he hang out with? It's basically Spock and Bones because mm-hmm. they're even though they're subordinate to him, they're they're his high up command structure. Right? And this is after earlier in the film when they showed other people having flirty fun and, and forming romantic relationships. But Kirk can't do that. Like this is a part of his humanity that he, he can't engage in at all because now that's your underling. Like that there's there's first there's power, power, power issues. And then also he can't be in the command of the ship if he's if he's unconsciously or even consciously thinking about like, oh, my girlfriend's in deck seven or whatever, right? And so this is very cool. This is very cool because you need to have the right personalities for the right jobs. And we've seen in Star Trek in the 2000, I think it was nine, and then also in Into Darkness, this version of Kirk is very good at look before you leap. He's very good at take command, make decisions and go into battle. Um, But for the five-year mission, maybe he just doesn't have the right personality for it. Yeah, so it seems like they gave Kirk the five-year mission, but they shouldn't have, they being Starfleet Command, because right. he's looked before Leap, he's a womanizer, he likes the social life, he likes yeah. being captain, he likes to be very competent, but maybe a five-year mission out to the frontier is for somebody else, and he needs to be closer to home with lots of shore leave, that kind of thing. But so, look, for, look Before You Leap is great because... They're going out into deep space, which is a just a little look before you leap. But does he have that internal fortitude? Maybe he needs the short leave, which is which be, not not a bad thing. Like that's okay. Not, not a bad thing. It's just the right personality. Would, yeah. So he would be deployed closer to the Federation planets yeah. as a captain, not necessarily exploring. But which is just not just not deep exploring like that, where you right. get that that real loneliness for extended periods yeah. of time. Where yes. who can he confide in, confide in with, who can he talk to mm-hmm. on basically McCoy and Spock? Mm-hmm. Do you think a a captain and crew that goes on a long term mission in and from Starfleet, they need to have like be married and have families and stuff that come with them, so that they're they're like we're not looking for social life, we're not looking for shore leave, like this is our life that we've built, and so. We're going to go explore. It's peaceful. We're not looking for danger. So our families are along for the ride. And so we're all healthy and happy. So that's that's an interesting question. So how would having a family with you affect your behavior as a Starfleet officer? I would imagine that you would experience less loneliness because you got your yep. family there with you. But also, I think you would be less willing to take risks. Yep which is maybe good for deep space exploration. You know, just go out there, check it out, write down anything mm-hmm. interesting, and come back, and leave, leave yeah. quickly, right? Because you're out and you're yeah. not supported. The bad side of not taking risk is there may be some risks that you want to take while you're out in space, and then you would have a crew that's averse to that. Um, pros and cons. Maybe there's a right balance in there. Right. I mean, at some point, somebody's going to have to put their life on the line if it's exploration, you are more risk averse than some sort of gung ho military squadron. Mm. So maybe it does strike the right balance to have families on board. You know? I don't know. Maybe don't that's know. why in TNG they have families on board. That could be why in TNG they have families on board, is because it brings the crew. The crew doesn't need to worry about, like, oh, I need shore leave. I need to go back home. Like, no, I am home. Yeah, I see my, my kids growing up right here. Yeah, they're going to school right here. Mm. I have, mm. you know, my family here, and yeah, I'm good. Maybe, maybe from deep space missions like this, this is why in TNG they have Deanna Troy to be the ship's counselor. Oh, and they haven't implemented that yet in this could be in the in the the regular what the original series or in this case the original series timeline. Mm-hmm. So time the, in the Kelvin timeline, but the original series time date. of. Date, yeah, yeah, yeah start yeah, date. date. There it is. Start date, yeah. yeah, yeah. They haven't implemented the counselor yet, and that'll help in the future. I like it. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, are we yeah. we're explaining why there are families on the Enterprise? Yep. And Enterprise we're explaining D. Enterprise D, and some lessons learned from, like, maybe captains and officers are having mental problems, so throw a counselor on there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then it resolves some of the problems they've encountered 
for exploration missions in the past that have been implemented in the mm -hmm. TNG Deep Space Nine Voyager timeline or time date star date star date star date yep yep twenty three hundred like whatever yep yeah mm -hmm. I like um, it but put the counselor in a standard uniform yeah put the counselor in a standard uniform this is wild so after the enterprise has been doing a retrofit in the yorktown they're like okay it's time for us to go on a mission and they, they like a launch they launch so aggressively it's so dangerous what are they doing yeah, locked in dialed in yep. what are we doing <laughs> we don't need to do this there's no reason lieutenant o'hara open a ship wide channel super calm though super calm very nice character super, yeah. Yeah, we don't need to be doing this. So just just go through this launch tunnel at a yeah. reasonable, slow, you know, impulse, you know, one quarter, one eighth impulse. Yeah. Just just drift out. There's no need for this urgency. If they were, if this was like a combat ship, like in yeah. like in Battlestar Galactica, yeah. or or on like modern naval carriers, mm -hmm. I get it. You gotta like launch out, get out there fast, get into combat, mm -hmm. go go go. Yep. Um, but this is not this. This is you got plenty of time. Just get out there safely. And then once you're outside, now you're full in ball, So then you get to warp speed after that. I didn't, I didn't get it. But, it, but, but also, I guess one more, one more thing. So, so in Battlestar Galactica, you had these like launch tubes. Okay, okay, yep. Get them out there, get them out fast. Now in, on carriers, yes, get them out, get them out fast. But really the key point there is get the, the headwind. So that way you get lift. But for the Enterprise, you don't need lift. It's a spaceship. That's right. You don't need, you don't need additional speed. It has the engines to get up to speed. Oh, you, you, know, you, when don't, it, you don't you don't have aerodynamics. You don't need yeah. wind speed. You don't yeah. need knots. You don't. Okay. And in Battle in Battlestar Galactica, they launched them to a high speed because they want them to get away from the Battlestar Galactica fast. Oh, because the because the Battlestar is taking attack from it, the Cylons from the base stars. Right. So you don't want yeah. them to get in the. You don't want to get. You don't want the Vipers to get hit by stray shots. You want to get by them away, shots. and then they get, can curve in and attack. Right, exactly. exactly. So get them away from the ship, and then they can deploy. But this isn't that situation. This is not a combat situation. First, and the tube isn't clear. Like right. there's like shit stocked, and like if there's like a dink, <laughs> that's right. Someone over here like loses a wrench and then it drifts and then it gets into a nacelle. Like, yeah. If if you're gonna do this kind of launch, like why not have a dedicated launch tube? It's nice, clear debris, clear of everything. We're cool. We're like simultaneously docking and maintenance and all kinds of stuff while launching ships i mean this is just a coordination nightmare a nightmare the only the only resolution i can come up with that is that maybe this is just like the end of the tube like this is like the very very you've loaded up your spitball at the very end of the straw but you got a bunch of other things behind it weird weird, weird, well, weird. let's march it forward a little bit is okay so i see there's docking and like there's like sh oh, gosh, commuter there's ships going ships moving around here yep ships moving around okay i still see infrastructure still see infrastructure but no more ships no more no more no, no more, sh yeah, no more be, ships might be okay uh, it still oh, it looks so cool though it's so cool what is this room it's still a little like walk it out like is yeah just it's it still sweet like 20 second 10 seconds versus five minutes yeah, that's right. So <laughs> yeah, really? that's right. It's, it's not so urgent. What are we doing? So this is looks like a big cavernous room. Yeah. Okay. So let's walk it through. I mean, there's a little tube. Yeah. Opens up to this room with these yeah. guys. I don't know what they are. Don't know what they are. And then yeah. it closes back down to a small tube. And so that looks like a tube that is going through a larger room. Mm hmm. Right. And so I don't know what this room is, but I can imagine like a, there could be a, a ship coming across here. This this is analogous to a car that's in a narrow alleyway and then it it needs to inch up to the to the crosswalk. Otherwise there could be someone coming coming across here real fast. Yeah. Which just means come up slowly. Yeah, it just it just all looks unnecessarily high risk and high com high complexity. I guess, you know, it's in the future. They have better technology, better coordination, better everything. And so maybe this isn't risky, but I would want it simplified. Like, yeah, uh, just, just go a bit slower. My other thought was maybe this is time-lapsed, right? So maybe they are going slow, but then 
I didn't see any sign of it. So what right. I used was I looked at these ships and mm -hmm. they look like they're going just constant speed. Like there's no clear, like mm -hmm. now we are turned on our time lapse or going faster. That's right. And they look like they're going at a reasonable speed, trying to get through that tube reasonably. I think it's just launch. Just launched. I don't get it. The Yorktown is just a high risk place no matter what. They just they just want high risk at all times, adrenaline rush. Starfleet is bored. Well, this, this would be cool though, <laughs> if they're ever attacked and they're like, get the ships in the launch tube. Pew, 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 pew. That's true. But they only have one launch tube, so it's one at a time. If the first ship has a problem, then all the other ships behind it are stuck. <laughs> Yeah, in that case, you would want all of the docking infrastructure to be on the outside of the Yorktown right. so that all the ships can dock right on the edge. And if an enemy is in, you know, coming, you just launch. Launch them out. There's, there's just no, turn them around and point them out. Mm -hmm. There's no, like, traffic jam inside where it's like, I got to launch and I can't because, you know, I've got to... You know, they're all there, beep, ready to beep. go. They're just, just, just honking. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so this is after uh, Kirk and Spock and the Enterprise are going to go explore the nebula. And gosh, so let's let's watch. The nebula is so dense that they can't go around it. So the nebula is so dense they can't easily go through it, and it's so large they can't go around it. Interesting nebula. Let's let's listen to what they say. Our mission is straightforward: rescue a crew stranded on a planet in uncharted space. Our trajectory will take us through an unstable nebula, one which will disable all communication with Starfleet. So he says, he, Kirk says, we have to go through the nebula, can't go around it, and it's going to interrupt communications. So, and just looking at it, it's so dense, we have to navigate through it like it's challenging. So it's got to be big, so I can't go around it, but it's got to be dense, so it's dangerous and blocks communications. That's right, because a normal nebula... A normal nebula is like 99.99 something percent just hydrogen right and then a little bits of helium and then a little even smaller amounts of like lithium boron other yeah. other heavy elements right. yep and so for a normal nebula you could probably just punch through it it's thin it's very thin gas it, it right. you can see through it not a problem and so but but they're big so it may be it may, could be several hundreds thousands of light years i'm not sure yeah, about those numbers like don't that. quote me yeah. and so like yeah okay i could see how it'd be hard to go around it uh, but on the other hand starfleet has warp capabilities so right. i mean maybe just just go around it right? right so this this is like a magic nebula it's it's so big that they can't go around it even though they have warp speed and but also so dense that they can't just zip through it no problem how big is this nebula like what's the well, mass of this nebula and uh let's yeah. estimate let's it. do it let's do it okay so our goal is to estimate the mass of the nebula yep and so our knowns is a bullet point that we didn't flesh out yeah i think we don't <laughs> i think we don't well we don't have any knowns actually you don't have any knowns. okay that's, right, we, have that's to, right. we have to we have to guess densities and masses based on right the enterprise and other things they've just said. So so let's make some reasonable estimates, see what we get. So if we want to figure out the mass of the nebula, we need to know the mass and density of the rocks. Yep. And while we're not there, we don't know what these rocks are. We can estimate it, maybe Earth-like rocks. And yep. so that's 5,500 5, kilograms per meter cube. And yeah, there yep. are some rocks that are more dense than others. There are some rocks like, like shale that's a fairly low density, yep. but not like a factor of 10 to 100. And, and and where we're going to get to, even if we've underestimated by a factor of 100, not going to matter. Yeah, it not matter. And certainly from the pictures, it looks like rocks. So oh, we're not like talking rocks. like, yeah, right. yeah, we're not talking like diffuse gas. We're talking rocks. Solid, solid objects. Solid objects that the enterprise needs to worry about. Even if they have shields, they need to worry about getting yeah. banged up. Getting banged up yeah. okay. So if you know the mass density of the rocks, if we know the volume of the rocks, then we can figure out the mass of there. Mm -hmm. And so this is a bit tricky. Um, we'll estimate it as the length of the enterprise and l let's support that. Yeah. So here from this picture of the nebula, um, a little bit tricky because there's some forced perspective. These rocks yeah. are closer and these rocks are farther, uh, further, farther, either way. Yeah. And so let's try to look in the same plane, the same like rectangle as the enterprise. 
So the Enterprise, we looked it up, is, what did we say? It was 300 meters? 300 meters, 300 yeah. Meters. Looked it up 20, on... 289, 300. Yeah. And so the nebula needs to be dense, but not too dense. If it's If it's not dense enough, then the rocks are far apart. And so there's like, yeah, no problem. I'll just fly through this, right? If it's too dense, then it's like a, it's getting closer and closer to the solid wall. And so it was like, we can't even do this. We got to just go around. Yeah. So that means that the distances between the rocks. The, yeah, so we oh, were yeah, and yeah, they yeah, need to be yeah, enterprise ish yeah, we sized, right? Yeah. So we were ent we were estimating that the rocks, if we look at that picture, if we look at the size of the enterprise, which we looked up on memory alpha is about 300 meters. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at rocks nearby it, there's some that are slightly there, bigger, some that are slightly smaller, there, some there. that are in between. So we're saying average size of the rocks may be three, same size as the Enterprise-ish. Okay. I think that's a yeah, good, something like, something like that. good estimate. And then, and then we, we then need to know the density. Right. Because because how close is that? If, if, if you have the Enterprise here and another rock, the first rock is like super far away, not a problem, right? So it's got to be, I don't know, something like a third, a third? Yeah, so you can I think fit three enterprises between rocks, right? Because, like you said, okay. if they're too dense, it's like a wall can't get through. If mm -hmm. it's not dense enough, it's not a problem. I just go right through, and the scanners can penetrate too. Yeah. So it's got to be dense enough that is dangerous, but not so dense that it's impossible. Right, and this seems and so like if reasonable. I, if I'm driving my car at like you know okay speed, and mm -hmm. if I have, if I'm in my lane, and then there's an empty lane next to me on each side and then a car like i feel pretty comfortable right yeah 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 so, so uh one kilometer in one way but then we need a volume so we cube that up yep so one Sounds rock good. every every kilometer that's a, yeah. that's pretty okay it's pretty small it's pretty okay yeah okay so then if we have the mass of each rock and then the density of the rocks in space we need to get the total volume of the nebula um, and we can multiply all that up, but that is a tricky number. So, so in in Star Trek Into Darkness, they go from Kronos, the Klingon homeworld, to Earth in yep. like it must be like a half hour or something. It's something fast, yeah. which which I think can't be right. <laughs> it, it can't be right because that would mean it would be this nebula would be several light years in diameter, and gosh, yeah. It can't be right. That's enormous. That's, that's enormous for for rocks this size. Yeah. So, yeah, so what make a low end guess? Is that was that what you're gonna say? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. We should let's stick with a light year first, okay. and see so let's, what let's kind of numbers end. we get. Yeah, okay. because I think one light year is a low end. Because if it was one light, if the nebula was one light year in diameter, then the Enterprise could easily go around it. Let's go around it. Let's go around it. But yeah. we are unsure, so let's make this as the low end estimate and see what kind of mass we get. Hundred thousand million billion trillion quadrillion, so nine point four quadrillion meters. So big, sure, big, big, but it's a low end estimate, right? Okay, so now that we have the radius of the nebula, we can do a volume estimate, and we're not going to worry about that four thirds in pi. We'll just cube it up. We, we have a cube nebula. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but that's still that's still <laughs> eight point five times ten to the forty seventh meters cubed. What is? I have no concept of what this number is. It's so enormous. It's so enormous. Uh, so it's but, 10 to the 47. Damn. But it's space. It's space. Space is big. Maybe space, that's space okay. Yeah. Maybe it's okay. Yep. Okay. So then we can now get the number of rocks. So if we have the density and the times of the volume, we can now, we can, we can multiply the volume by the density here. And so you get 8.5 times 10 to the 38th rocks. Again, <laughs> an enormous number, number of rocks. Well, what is, what is a mole? A mole is times 10 to the 23rd. Right. So this is an absolutely gargantuan number of rocks. Yeah. I, yeah. 15. Okay. So, okay. But, but it's a number, whatever it is. I mean, yeah. my, my intuition breaks down. That's okay. We trust the numbers. We've had good, good arguments thus far. Mm -hmm. So now we can get the mass of the nebula. We just multiply this all together. So the number of rocks times the mass per rock. And yeah. so this gets us a number that is this, that, that is this. Just multiply all the numbers together. Yep. One point six times ten to the 40, 49th kilograms. Yep. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, that's just it's so, just a big number. So let's put this in some context here. Yeah. So let's look at Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star is the supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way. 
I don't know if it's the the largest. Uh, I'm not I'm not an astronomer, but it's it's a super massive black hole. It's huge. Um, Sagittarius A star. The whole Milky Way is going around it. Mm -hmm. So that's 4.3 million solar masses. That's 4.3 million times the mass of our sun. Yep. Okay. So let's let's we're working in kilograms over here. So let's convert. So now we have one solar mass. It's two times ten to the thirtieth kilograms. I mean, I mean, first off, look at the comparison between the solar mass, which is times 10 to the 30th, and the number we got. The number we got is, what is it, times 10 to the 49? Oh, 49. So yeah. we're... we're, we're which, which, is, which is 19. 19 doesn't sound like a number, but it's, it's 19 zeros. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's 19 zeros times bigger than yeah. the sun. This yeah. is getting comical. Oh. Oh, it gets worse. Okay, let's 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 put it. Yeah. It's push yeah. it through. Okay, so Sagittarius A star is equal to this times kilo, this many kilograms, thirty six. So that means if I divide the nebula by the mass of Sagittarius A star, we get what is this? Hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, one point eight trillion supermassive black holes. That's yep. one point eight six tera Sagittarius A stars. This is enormous. This this is this is absolutely enormous. And in fact, I think we looked it up. This is like m much bigger than the mass of the entire Milky Way itself. That's right. <laughs> it's, so it's more mass. There's more mass in this nebula than in all of the quadrants combined. All alpha, beta, delta, and, gua and gamma. Yeah. All the quadrants combined there has fewer has has less mass than this one nebula. Yeah. So this is a statement about space is really, really, really big, and it's you yeah. cannot fill. You being like, I guess, God who created the galaxy cannot fill this tiny area, ti relatively tiny. One light year is rel is super tiny on the galactic scale, mm -hmm. with any with dense mass. You just can't do it because it's it's too much mass. It's too much mass. It's not just too much mass. It's like an absurdly large amount of mass. It's it would collapse into the most massive black hole of all time. Yep, it should be collapsing into a black hole. Into right. many black holes, which then collapse into one black hole. Maybe the whole quadrant is wrecked. Or the, not the whole quadrant. The entire Milky Way is wrecked. Is wrecked by this this amount of mass here. Also weird. Now that I'm now I'm thinking about it, why are there rocks? If it's a nebula, shouldn't it be hydrogen helium? I mean, they called it a nebula. Which, when I think of a nebula, I think of diffuse hydrogen helium gas in like these diffuse big meaning bubbles. like thin, like thin, thin, thin gas. Like, yeah, it's like. I don't know the density, but it's like hundreds, thousands of particles per spa per cubic meter. It, it, if you, it, if it was replaced with oxygen, you could not survive. Easily, yeah, you would. It's essentially a vacuum for most applications. A little bit to guess. Hear about little that, bits but it's of mostly guess. just empty. Just empty. If, you, if you if you need like a hard vacuum in the lab, I think it's not good enough. Maybe, but I think for a lot of vacuum systems that we create in the lab, a, a nebula is plenty of vacuum so it's like slightly more gas than the rest of the galaxy it is not like rocks slamming into each other right. so my so, my thoughts are if there's rocks then it's not hydrogen and helium so that means this is all star debris because in order for there for to be elements that are heavy enough to become rocks that means it needs to have come from a star core um, in which case then shouldn't this be blowing up and expanding I don't know. But, it, don't know but it's, it's, it's super weird because in a exploding star, it's still mostly hydrogen and helium. That's right. So when, it's, a, it's, when a star explodes, so if it's, small, if it's a small star exploding, then you get rings of hydrogen, helium, and then I think lithium is the next stuff. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you get rings that are sorted by their, their atomic mass. And then in the core, you might have an iron core yeah. or maybe a, a neutron core. Um, or if it's a supermassive black star, you get you go straight to black hole. But in all of those, it's expanding outward, and, and it's a gas or plasma. It's, it's not a gas. Rocks. That's right. It's not it's solid, not, right? Because for the rocks to form, it needs to be cool enough and dense enough for the yeah. for the atoms to to form together. But inside of a star is hot. It's a plasma, so it's it's like individual atoms blasting out. So there's really no way for this nebula to form, and it's wildly unrealistic in terms of mass Massive. and size. In fact, the entire this was a, Milky Way. This was an underestimate. This is a size yeah. that the Enterprise could easily just go bip around. 
right? It's, this was a conservative estimate right here in this light year. Yeah. And we could mess around with some of these numbers, but we would have to mess around with them at such a scale to get that number any, to anything realistic that I think we just have to declare the nebula itself unrealistic. Unrealistic. Which is the bummer because it's yeah. super important that it yeah. be this dense and this large. Otherwise, nothing else like happens in the movie. That's right. They need it to be uncharted. They need it to be um, dense so that you can't see it through it. Then you can't communicate out. Yep. It needs to be dense so that they've never been explored before. Yeah. Bummer. Bummer. Big bummer. Okay, but cool though. I mean, cool. also cool, like super massive, super mm -hmm. massive nebula that has more mass than the entire Milky Way. There's got to be some minerals you can mine from there. I... Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe some ancient civilization was like, we're going to make this. And then they... But the tech in the, in the space was preserved. So it doesn't collapse into a black hole and it's like spawning rocks from space. I don't Maybe this is some ancient, ancient <laughs> alien ancient aliens like trash hole. You just throw all this stuff here. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. They put an anti black hole device right there and they just throw their trash in. That's right. Because a black <laughs> hole is well, how you gonna how you go undo that? But if you have a an impossibly dense region of space trash, then yeah, you just keep it there. Keep it there.